This is Old Town Portland. It consists of mainly three sections, Chinatown, the Skidmore Historical District, and the Yamhill Historical District. Buildings still standing around here date back to the 1850s, Portland's first decade of existence. It is also, remarkably, the second largest representation of a certain type of architectural structure in all of America. Following only the Soho neighborhood of New York, Portland's Old Town boasts the largest number of cast iron buildings. Using a process of melting iron alloy into a liquid with the use of a massive blast furnace, and then remelting that liquid into casts, allowing for iron-based structures of great detail, variety, and beauty, thus is how cast iron architecture came to be. And if one visits certain parts of Old Town, you'll find yourself overwhelmed with architectural beauty all around you at each and every turn. The concept and existence of cast iron existed not only long before Portland's establishment, but long before America was established. It dates back as a substance as far back as the 9th century in certain parts of Asia. Structurally, however, the oldest building to be produced using a cast iron frame was the Ditherington Flax Mill Building in England, built in 1796. It still stands today. Several decades later, the concept of cast iron structures would come into vogue in America, pioneered by New York-based architect James Bogardus. He was one of the first to promote this style of building creation in the 1850s. Cast iron not only suggested endless possibilities in terms of intricate beauty, but it was also cheap to build with, something that had to be attractive to a newly developing city like Portland. Like most Oregon towns, Portland first developed when settlers relocated there after traveling along the Oregon Trail. While Lewis and Clark passed through there decades earlier, and the territory had been densely inhabited by indigenous members of the Chinook people, settlers started arriving in the 1830s. Portland was finally incorporated as a city in 1851, with an approximate population of 800 people. Like many early American cities, the preponderance of its buildings, businesses and homes, were modestly constructed wooden structures. And while wood would continue to be a prominent tool in building construction in Portland over the years, the city would quickly follow the ways of a town to the south called San Francisco, which was taking full advantage of this newfound craze called cast iron architecture. As a port town, much of Portland's early development was along the Willamette River's waterfront, where cast iron buildings went up all over the place and overnight, a small, rugged, rural town became a mecca of architectural sophistication, especially along Front Avenue. Within two years of its inception, Portland had its own cast iron foundries being established to churn out as much steel as possible. Some foundries would stay open all night just to keep up with the demand. The 1860s would represent the peak of the development of these foundries, most of which were along the city's waterfront, along with pretty much everything else. Because of this, and due to the major changes that have happened along Portland's waterfront over the years, there's no remains of these old Portland-based foundries. However, one only has to travel a little south to the Portland suburb of Lake Oswego, the one-time site of the Oregon Iron and Steel Company. Today it's known as George Rogers Park, but if you visit this space and go down by the river, you will see a towering structure standing there, quite seemingly out of place. This structure was the Oregon Iron and Steel Company's blast furnace, 
dating back to the 1860s. This is the oldest iron blasting furnace still standing west of the Rocky Mountains. Lake Oswego most definitely had major plans of becoming a cast iron smelting mainstay in America, not just in Oregon. But this was a dream that never quite came to be. However, you can still find all sorts of remains of that past, including a small worker's cabin that stands not too far from the park, and even a piece of iron used to support a plaque near a house just down the street from that cabin. By the early 1900s, this site finally began shifting away from the production of cast iron and began shifting primarily into realms of hydroelectricity. In fact, if one seeks adventure and wanders down by Oswego Creek in the trees and the sticks, downstream from that old iron and steel site, you can find a relic of that electrical transition. These early years in Portland were only the beginning, however, as cast iron architecture would remain a fixture in the city until the end of the 1890s, making it the structural style of choice in Portland for its first 40 years of existence. Many of the structures we can still see today are wondrous relics of that era. My personal favorites include the new market block, built in the heart of the commerce of Portland in 1872. It was built as a theater complex and marketplace. The block's whole north wing has been demolished, but fortunately, the cast iron arches that lined the front of that wing were left on site as a beautiful reminder of what once was. In the Chinatown neighborhood stands two glorious structures, back to back, pushed north and towards a somewhat less frequented part of the city's waterfront, Bloggen Block and Bickle Block are two gems that are easy to miss. Bloggen Block, built in 1888, was originally an office and warehouse for a luggage company. It has also been dubbed the largest cast iron building still standing on the west coast. The Bickle Block was also originally a warehouse type building, constructed in 1883. A fire in 1972 damaged the building and it fell into a drastic state of disrepair, before massive renovations in recent years have restored it to an eye-catching beauty. Also in the Chinatown area stands the Merchant Hotel, originally built in 1880 one of the oldest hotels still standing in the downtown Portland area. It's a massive structure, bolstered by the fact that it was added onto only a couple years after its initial completion. Another building that also fell into disrepair, the Merchant still stands, almost 140 years old, and it looks better than ever. The Smith Block, built in 1872, and one of my deep personal favorites, is a remarkably beautiful and significant structure. Along what was once a front avenue lined with cast iron buildings that dwarfed Smith Block, the Smith is the only one along this stretch of cast iron make that is still standing. It too got a hearty facelift several years back and looks pretty stunning for being 146 years old. Only a block south of Smith, there was another rare vestige to the city's early style. Built in 1883, the Feckheimer and White Building stands as a landmark and a shift in the later years style of cast iron structures that occurred in Portland, shying away from massive block-sized structures for a more thin and tall motif. This can be seen in other structures of that time, like the Failing Building, the Sufert Building, the Love Building, the Harker Building, 
the Phoenix Building, and the Gleason Building, all built between 1878 and 1889. But for all of this constructive beauty that put its stamp on the early years of Portland, it was almost all lost in the flicker of a flame. By 1872, Portland was 21 years old and boasting a population of around 10,000 people. Despite a building reputation as a rough and rugged port town, the city was still booming and moving forward. This all was thrown into disarray only three days before Christmas, in the early morning hours, when a fire broke out at a waterfront Chinese laundromat. A late response to the fire led to it expanding, ultimately torching more than two blocks along Front Avenue between Morrison and Alder Streets. Citizens panicked, scrambling through the streets and throwing possessions out into the street in an effort to keep them from burning. Things escalated to such levels of chaos that local militias were brought in to maintain order, while Chinese immigrants were forced at gunpoint to help fight the fires. By the early afternoon, rains came to town, which helped quash the flames, saving the city from a catastrophic disaster. The greatest tragedy, potentially, of this event was the fact that Chinese immigrants in town were harassed and assaulted mercilessly in the aftermath of a fire that was blamed on a Chinese laundromat worker who presumably allowed a fire to start behind his building. Today, however, it's more believed that this fire was started by an anti-Chinese entity looking to damage their reputation in the city. Months later, in the summer of 1873, letters started showing up at businesses who hired Chinese immigrants, suggesting connections to the Ku Klux Klan and demanding they cease hiring Chinese workers or, in a couple of weeks, arrangements would be made to show the dangers of hiring Chinese workers. A few weeks later, another fire broke out along First Avenue near the Metropolis Hotel. Another early morning fire brought another delayed response while the heat and winds of summer helped spread the fire quickly Within an hour, over seven blocks had been completely destroyed. In this case, the fire burned and burned until it literally ran out of material to keep it burning. A major asset to this was the fact that the 1872 fire had left an open barren space that served as a fire block for the flames that were spreading north. Still, when the dust had settled, 22 city blocks had been reduced to unrecognizable rubble. The only building on site to survive the fire unscathed is the Northrop, Blossom, and Fitch building. This building still stands today, the second oldest commercial structure in the city, dating back to 1858. Portland's oldest commercial structure, the Halleck and McMillan building, built in 1857, is also the city's oldest cast iron structure still standing. However, tragically, the building was drastically altered many years back and looks nothing like it originally did. Plans have been in place for the past couple of years to restore this old building back to its old 1850s cast iron glory. So hopefully, not too far down the road, it will loom beautifully along the Willamette once again. The fire of 1873 drastically altered the future of Portland in terms of commerce, geography, and also in terms of the fate of its cast iron structures. The fire had destroyed almost all of the city's cast iron buildings of the time, but the city was resilient and after the effects of the Panic of 1873 leading to a national recession, by 1878 the city was at work replacing all that was lost along these 22 blocks. By this time, cast iron architecture was still the in thing, and many of the buildings constructed over the rubble of this fire still stand today, 
in particular in the Yamhill Historical District. This is the Yamhill Historical District, the southern fringe of Old Town Portland. This is where the upper half of the 1873 fire had torched the city. It's astonishing to see this area today and to think once this was a barren, fired out wasteland. The area is still lined with cast iron structures today. One of the few buildings to survive the fire was the Wakefield Glen Building. Next to it, the Pierne and Poppleton buildings, constructed in the 1860s, had been torched. Interestingly enough today, one of the only buildings demolished in this area is the Wakefield Glen Building. Meanwhile, the Pierne and Poppleton buildings were rebuilt using the original cast iron of those original 1860s structures. Today, they stand as beautiful reminders of their architectural style and the perseverance of a city. On another smaller note, a small piece of the Wakefield Glen building does still remain, lining the north side of the Pierne building. Across Yamhill Street sits a string of three cast iron structures, all going up in 1878. The thin and lengthy Van Rensselaer block is another great reminder of that more compact style of cast iron construction that grew in popularity in the 1870s and 1880s. Across from First Street stands the Mikado block, built in 1880, which stands almost alone against the city's more contemporary structures. Along Yamhill, between First and Second Avenues, stands the easy-to-miss Franz building, also constructed in 1880. And across Yamhill Street from the Franz, stands the Willamette and Strowbridge blocks, back to back. While built four years apart, the buildings complement each other perfectly. These were the many remarkable structures that were plotted out to revive the fire-torched city's waterfront, and they live on to tell the tale of renewed life. However, with the onset of this next generation of cast iron structures, they faced a rather dark future as, with this land looming dormant for most of the mid-1870s, the focus of the city's commerce had to shift elsewhere, moving the city's main economic hub further inland and away from the river. This left a much weaker economic situation in the blocks down by the Willamette where much of the city's cast iron buildings stood. This would, over the next several decades, lead to vacancies, neglect, and decay in many of these buildings. A process of degradation that peaked during the 1930s with the onset of the Great Depression. The riverfront had become blighted with most of these buildings being used for storage or sometimes as makeshift flop houses. In one of the city's earliest adventures to relieve urban blight, starting in the early 1940s, the city began demolishing many of these run-down cast iron structures, some of which were almost a hundred years old. This would be an ongoing process all the way into the 1970s with whole areas completely changing. No area was this more prominent than on Front Avenue, now the NATO Parkway, which used to be lined on both sides by towering structures, but today is rather open with only a few cast iron mainstays. By the end of the 1970s, fortunately, the city began to shift people were developing a better understanding and even appreciation for the historical significance of older buildings in town, a love that I still see fairly prominent today. Decades of mass demolition reverted, going into the 1980s, to efforts to preserve and restore. We have this transition to thank for the fact that we still, somehow, have so many beautiful cast iron buildings to see in Portland today. 
Nevertheless, it's truly unfortunate that so many breathtaking structures had to disappear under the notions of progress. got some of Portland's coolest cast iron remaining structures located along the stretch of First Avenue. You got these three lined up against each other. You got the pier and the Poppleton, the Patrick Building, Stroll Bridge. I think it's this one right here and then the Lambeth Block on the other side of that. But then as you turn, you'll notice uh, things have been drastically altered. You've got the Max Line going through here. And then you've got all these gone ramps leading on to Morrison's as well. The approximate site of where Green's building was, because they said it was demoed to make way for all of this that's happening here, leading to the Morrison Bridge over there. For this building in particular, I haven't been able to find a specific address, unlike the rest of these ones, because I heard conflicting information saying that uh, Green's building was located on First in Columbia, but First in Columbia is way back that way. So it makes no sense if the Morrison Bridge is right here. So I would presume it was on First, uh, which I'm standing along right now. And obviously it's more of a train route going that way. Um, and it alters, you know, there's the NATO Parkway up over there. That's technically the first street closest to the river, but if you figure this was First Avenue, the Green, or Green's building as it was called, probably somewhere, like literally right here. That's about the best estimate I could say if it was along First and it was demolished so that literally this right here could come in. Now walking along Morrison Street, downtown, heading to the corner of Southwest 3rd and Morrison for the next no longer here piece of cast iron history. So I'm looking towards the southwest corner of this street because uh, this is the site, it's now the site of Pioneer Place which is a fairly new mall. A lot of old buildings were probably demoed for this to happen. Uh, but this is where, right at this corner here, this is where Cambridge Block was. That was demoed, according to sources I've seen, in 1962. And so with Cambridge Block right here, at 3rd and Morrison, you need only walk a couple of blocks to find the location of the council building, which was another cast iron building that was built a little, or demolished a little later than that one. It was demolished in the 70s. And literally, it was located right past, this is the Deacon building, this big brownish one, right past it is 3rd, and that's where the council building was located. So while uh, much of Portland's cast iron, the bulk of their cast iron buildings are considered to be more prominent in the Old Town neighborhoods, or Old Town and Skidmore historical areas, which are located down this way, I'll be heading down there in a little bit. I'm in the heart of the Yamhill Historical District, and you'll note there's three beautiful cast iron buildings behind me. There's four more over here. There's one literally right here. Uh, this little place right here is a haven.
And so while a lot of Portland's early commerce, 1800s, when all these cast iron buildings were in their heyday, so much of it was along the river, which is right, you know, right over here, and then a little bit south of here, you know, you, you brought in a lot of products by ship. So, you know, it was convenient to have all your businesses and all your commerce right by the river so you could get all your goods nice and quick. And, you know, railway lines come in a little bit further north. Um, so I'm walking south. I'm walking away from where the main hub was for cast iron buildings because there were some a little bit further down south. Well, they were, it seems they were a little bit more sparse by comparison. Uh, but there still were a smattering of old cast iron buildings south of uh, Skidmore area, Old Town area, the Yam Hill area, which I literally am just now leaving. You'll notice it's a lot more contemporary in this area around me. But anyway, trying to get over towards, I believe, first in Maine, where there used to be another cast iron structure. So you'll note this is a very uh, modern stretch. They demoed a lot of stuff on the more southern edges of Portland back in the 50s and 60s, so everything is considerably newer. But I'm here at the intersection of First Avenue and Main, and I'm looking at what is the southwest corner. Uh, this building's called First and Main. You'll know this building looks fairly new. This was the site of the Smith and Watson building, uh, which was one of the last cast iron buildings to be demoed. It's uh, regarded as being demoed in the late 1970s and it stood here, uh, living a lot longer than most of the uh, cast iron buildings that got demoed. And uh, unfortunately, it took till about the 1980s before people started taking note of these awesome historical buildings and starting to do more to preserve them. Got to venture a little bit further south now, trying to get to the corner of Columbia and First Avenue. If I can make it through there, it's summertime is on the way, so of course there's construction all around me. Now I'm at First in Columbia. I'm pretty well out of range from where the bulk of Portland's cast iron buildings were, which is very interesting because right over here, the northwest corner of First in Columbia, is where one of Portland's most iconic cast iron structures was. This is where Lad Block was, named after you know, a famous uh, one of Portland's like most famous early citizens and I can't remember his full name right now. I want to say his name was William S. Ladd. Uh, he was a banker, he was involved in politics, he had his hand in just about everything that was going on in this town. And from what I've been able to gather, he was a pretty decent guy. You know, he obviously was well-to-do, but he, had, he really cared about, you know, developing and flourishing the city of Portland. And this was big old block. I think it covered, well, it was called Ladd Block. So I think it may have covered just about this whole entire city block. Now, it says in the information I got that the Ladd block was located in the northwest corner. Well, this is north and this is west, so this would be the northwest corner. Now, there's a building here, and apparently Ladd block was demolished in 1965 to make way for a parking lot. And there is a parking lot here on the southwest corner. Um, so, I tend to want to believe that this was still the location since that's what I've been told and a lot of these cast iron buildings were demolished and just kind of for the time being were just replaced with a parking lot and a lot of those parking lots were replaced with buildings. I just, I noticed a parking lot over my shoulder right across the street and I thought, eh, maybe the information is wrong, but history says that it was right here. From the site, 
of Land Block right over there. I'm heading just a little bit further south to find the BL Stone Building, which was a very ornate, very colorful uh, cast iron structure, or at least it was in its later years. And I'm looking for First and Market, and I believe I have, I'm already there. is first in market dead ahead right here and this was the intersection where the BL stone building was located I haven't been able to get a definitive address based on the one or two photographs that I've seen I want to predict that it was located at the, on the northwest corner which we put it right over here and I guess this is where the Oregonian is did not know that so using my predictive, if that is a word, skills, I'm guessing this is where the BL Stone Building was located. Now, based on the general look of the building, um, it kind of looks like it's along a main drag like first, so I'd almost want to say this side of the building would be where the front of the BL Stone Building was, and then this would be just kind of the side going up the street. That's just my estimation, though. And as I travel northbound, heading back towards the heart of Old Town, I'm going to head towards Oak Street now. There's actually, along 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, and Oak, there's uh, kind of iconic cast iron buildings that were demolished along each of those streets. So. You can tell already that Oak was obviously a hub of cast iron. So in a mecca of old buildings, if you look over here at this somewhat newer looking brown structure. This was the site of Union Block, which took up this whole entire block that this building is on. The intersection I'm coming up to now is Southwest Stark and Second, but Union Block went all the way down to Oak Street, a block down, and all the way to First, a block down that way. It filled, which I guess this is just, these two buildings are together, so imagine pretty much the structure of this whole building, but in an old cast iron block, and that's what the Union Block would have been way back when. Union Block was demoed in 1955. Someone actually uh, captured imagery of them in the midst of demolishing the building, so you can see it just crumbling to pieces and looking considerably smaller than what its uh, current replacement structure is. And here's the view from one block down at Oak in second, where you can get a better view of this overall shit. structure and, and realize how uh, big it is. Is. Because right here at this spot, this is the southeast corner of Oak in second, this is where Cook's block was. So they were lined up like right next to each other. Um, it wouldn't even surprise me, I'd have to check. And I discovered that. Union Block was demoed in 1955, and then Cook's Block over here was demoed in 1965. So when I show the picture of Union Block during its demolition, you'll be able to see Cook's Block right next to it. So that's pretty interesting, convenient, and sad. So while we have Union and Cook Blocks behind me, um, and this being Second and Oak, I'm now walking up to 3rd and Oak, <laughs> not exactly much of a travel, to the location of where the Ainsworth block was demolished, which is another place where fortunately someone at least took some pictures of its process of demolition. And it said in the information I saw that it was replaced with 
a parking lot, uh, but still currently a parking lot fills that space. So obviously this isn't a parking lot. The Portland Outdoor Store is not a parking lot. The Scientology place is not a parking lot, but uh, happens to be a parking lot right here. So this is where Ainsworth Block would have been. And one good way to tell, because it's not quite as common anymore, but back in the day, buildings were built right up against other buildings. Um, so sometimes you'll see a building demoed and you'll see this like ex exterior, you know, brick wall that's been covered for decades. And you'll see this building behind me, you can tell, you know, there's no windows. You can see just kind of the etch. You can tell that this was just butted up against another building. And this building itself looks fairly old, probably not as old as Ainsworth Block was, but this is likely the building that it was butted up against, and that's why it looks like there isn't really... This, you know, the initial intent was not to have this be an open wall, and hence no windows, no life <laughs> outside the building. And then from the site of Ainsworth Block, I need only go one block this way to get to Pine Street, which is where I want to go to, to see my next building. I only have like one or two spots left to stop off at. The next one I want to go to is, I think it's called Calm Block, maybe Cam. It's K-A-M-M -M Block. And it's located on Pine, which is right here, infamous Multnomah Hotel, where JFK and Martin Luther King have been to. A little side note. But I'm actually turning away from that and walking down Pine to the site of Calm Block, I'm just gonna call it Calm, which was located on the north side of Pine, which is this side. And it's said to be between First Avenue and Front, which is now the NATO Parkway, uh, which is now a parking lot, and I see a big parking lot right up here. Yep, here we are. A lot of construction going on, but we are getting into the heart of Old Town as construction happens in the area, which doesn't make me exactly happy. But yeah, here's this big parking lot. This is First Avenue where the Max rolls through. And yeah, Calm Block would have been right here. And again, it makes all the sense in the world. All the buildings on this block here are old cast iron structures still remaining from the 1800s. So. It's, there's reason to believe there was probably, this parking lot was probably lined with cast iron buildings. Right through here, you've got Kell, the backside of Kell's Pub. That is the Gleason building. That was technically regarded as the last uh, cast iron, like predominantly cast iron building made in Portland. You've got the new, uh, new market block, which is a theater. You've got, this was an old bank building. You've got the back side of Smith Block over here, which only half remains, and then you've got the front side of Smith Block right there. If you look down here, you've got the Seifert building. You've got the failing right over here. And right on the other side of this is where the Halleck and McMillan building is, which is the oldest commercial structure still standing and was a cast iron building. Apologize for all the construction noise. But yeah, they say Com Block was on Pine Street, which is this road, and it was between Front, which NATO Parkway there, and First Avenue, which is right here. So you think this would have been, front of the building would have been somewhere in this vicinity. And again, you've got all cast iron structures on this block. So Com Block, if I'm calling it by its correct name, would have been right here, right behind this little stock of trees. You've got Smith Block right through here. One of my most favorite buildings in Portland. Built in 1872. And you know, there's this gateways leading us into the Skidmore area, which is the last place I want to go to. Um, you know, this is Front Avenue. This is, you know, this, this area all through here. Every inch, this was just lined with cast iron buildings. There's these pictures of Portland pre-1940. We're just, this is just all cast iron buildings. And the Smith Block, located right here, which is a you know, good-sized building, like was just dwarfed by them. 
especially along this stretch here, you'll note there's either new stuff going up or there's nothing at all. This was, there were cast iron buildings about as tall as this new structure they were building, and then you see Smith Block right behind me, just dwarfed by it. Like, it's all cast iron. Just absolutely beautiful. Now we have to deal with all this new crap. It's just no creativity, no originality. It's just, let's make some rounded corners, make the windows pretty, put some orange on it, and woo! 21st century architecture. Here's this big Portland Fire and Rescue building. I know there used to be a lot of old buildings along this stretch too. And I'm heading towards the area of Ankeny Plaza, which is kind of at the heart of Old Town. It's right along where the Skidmore Fountain is. And this is another area, kind of right around the corner here, that was just lined with cast iron buildings, many of which were demoed all at the same time. However, as a memorial, there's lots of really cool little pieces. You can see this up here. There's lots of pieces like these. These definitely. I'm not sure what building, like there may have been a building here and they just demoed it and left these pieces here. But more than likely they were moved. I'm noticing, you can see kind of where it looks like they were adhered to this spot. But you've got 1883. These, these people, you can feel like, because this is almost, this is the stuff that was put around the outside of the cast iron, so you can almost feel a, there's almost a slight hollowness to it because there's, you know, something inside of there. Um, so yeah, these say 1883, which I can only assume is the, uh, I was going to say erection date, but that doesn't sound right. The date they were erected. And then there's some more right behind me. And just when I was thinking I wasn't going to be able to figure out what this structure was till I got home, we've got a plaque here. And it says, it's really hard to read. This is from the Smith and Watson building. Northeast corner of First Avenue and Main Street, demolished 1974. And that being known now that it's the Smith and Watson building that that piece is from, I can only assume these pieces are from the same building. They even have the same coloration of the uh, material that was put over them. So I can only assume that both pieces are from that same building. But that's cool. I've never really checked this out. I picked perfect time, perfect purpose to come do it. And I'm at the site of First and Ankeny, and it kind of just wraps around. And then here's the Skidmore Fountain right behind me. So before I get to these last uh, places, you've got the remains of one of the buildings back there, and then you've got the still standing archway that's right next to the new market block through here, which was built in 1872 to be a theater. I'm still at 
uh, Ankeny and First Street. And I just wanted to show you this cool area. Oh yeah, I knew about this. Yeah, the telephone exchange uh, building in operations in the back room of the Western Union building, which I can only assume was on or near this site next to the new market block. This was just uh, an extension. This was another wing to the new market block that was demolished, but they salvaged these. It says it was demolished in 1956, so it's incredibly surprising that they saved this much of the complex since they, you know, Back in the 40s and 50s and 60s into the 70s, I mean, there was a lot of just knocking the buildings down and getting them out of the way. This area was very decrepit, kind of almost abandoned in certain aspects, but to my surprise, they actually saved a lot of it. So that kind of explains why this side of the new market complex looks a lot different and more generic than the other three sides because there was another building right here a while ago and from under these beautiful cast iron remains of the north wing of the new market theater this is ankeny arcade is what it says on that sign over there you'll note it's mostly just this new big fire building i was standing here talking about oh uh, this big fire uh, fire and rescue building. There used to be a lot of buildings. I know there's a lot of buildings here that were demolished. Well, this is where that last string of buildings was that I wanted to talk to you about. This used to just be lined with cast iron buildings. There was at least four or five of them just right through here. And they all got demolished at the same time. They just got bulldozed over. Yeah, the Smith and Watson building remains that have been moved all the way over here because this is almost like an outdoor museum for cast iron. Uh, those remains from the Smith build or Smith and Watson building that I took you to earlier, and I have to pull up my notes to see for certain. Uh, yeah, one of the last buildings demoed, which is probably why those were salvaged because um, that building wasn't demoed till the late '70s, and kind of by the '70s and '80s, people were kind of starting to realize, hey. We're just knocking down a lot of our history. Decrepit as some of it was. Um, you know, so the city really turned it around and decided to revive a lot of these buildings. And so, you know, the new market block here has purpose again. Um, a lot of the cast iron buildings that went by down there have purpose. There's a few more big ones over here kind of heading over into Chinatown. They've been repurposed and they have new meaning again. But yeah, Smith & Watson building built in 1883, which explains why, you know, that's part of the solving of the riddle, why it's at 1883 on the exteriors. It was located at the northeast corner of Southwest First and Main. So yeah, several blocks down this way, uh, pretty much on the, not even really in Old Town, uh, kind of past the Yam Hill Historical District, which is kind of the southern end of Old Town. There's really nothing that predates the 60s past there. So yeah, man, this place is absolutely awesome. <laughs> so, I mean, it's the main mecca of the Skidmore Fountain, but there's so much more to be found out here. That was fun. I always love 
about pretty much anybody who does then and now type things. And I figured if I'm discussing the history of these cast iron structures in Portland, and so many of them were demoed between like 1940 and uh, like late 70s, it was definitely worthwhile to come out and visit Old Town, uh, you know, parts of Old Town to show some of these sites where these old cast iron buildings were because while we still have semblances of a lot of them i mean i only showed you a handful there are probably hundreds of cast iron buildings that either burned down over time or were demolished uh because they were kind of getting run down you know back in the four you know 30s going into the 40s or maybe just properties were bought and they were torn down. There's so many possible reasons for why so many amazing places, cast iron structures, were lost forever in this area. But thank God we still have some of them, right? By the end of the 1880s, the glamour of cast iron was finally fading. And while Portland looked to places like New York, New Orleans, and San Francisco for architectural motivation back in the 1850s, with the dawning of the 1890s in the 20th century just around the corner, the city was looking to places like Chicago, Illinois for their future. This led to the dawning of the Richardsonian Romanesque period that strived into the early 1900s and can still be seen in all its glory all over the city of Portland. Eighteen eighty nine is regarded as the ending of the cast iron craze in Portland, with the Gleason Building, located on Second Avenue in the thick of Old Town, considered to be the last of its kind to be built in the city. This is not to say that cast iron all but vanished after this point. Many buildings in Portland, post eighteen eighty nine, included elements of cast iron. This included the recently demolished United Workmen Temple that stood at 2nd and Taylor on the edge of Old Town. Built in 1892, this Romanesque style building was predominantly built of brick, but it did have two cast iron built columns standing along the main entrance to the building. As the demolition process began in the late summer of 2017, I visited this site frequently to capture a visual record of the final days of what was at the time my most favorite building standing in downtown Portland. With my reoccurring visits, I actually was becoming recognizable to some of the construction workers working on that demolition, one of whom walked up to me during my last visit there and handed me a box with something heavy inside. So I just stopped off, like, briefly. Just left the police precinct about 20, 30 minutes ago. Wanted to do a follow-up video on the what's left of the United Workmen Temple, because if you've been on my channel, you know that I've been doing that. And I haven't done it in a couple of weeks, so I feel bad about it. And I'm about to go to Beaverton and come back and meet my girlfriend. Um, I'm pretty sure it was the construction worker I talked to before gave me this. What's in this? I'll tell you in a second. So now I'm at a McDonald's in downtown just to show you what I took away. The construction worker, again, I think it was one that I had spoken to before, but I'm not dead certain either. 
Um, he just walked up to me with a box, told me he had something for me. And I thought it was maybe another brick, because it's about the right size. And he was like, nope. Opened it up. 